Uh, th thank you, Perry. Uh, so, can everyone hear me? Perfect. Yep, okay, thanks, fine. Perry, for the introduction, and also thank you so much for um, Kat, for inviting me to give this presentation, as well as um, for the great work that Katya and, and Katya's team have been doing in organizing this fantastic conference. The program is is very exciting. So I will now uh, share my screen. So if you can then please let me know that that is working okay. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And so before I start, um, I would like to say good day. And so I'm um, presenting today from the Dauru country and I uh, would like to um, acknowledge the traditional custodians and owners of this beautiful land that we've been able to do research on for quite some time now. And, uh, the, and that's the land of the Darug people of the Darug nation. And so they have owned the land and looked after the land for thousands of years and many, many generations. Um, I also uh, would like to acknowledge the many lands that we've been able to sample from uh, interesting insect species across Australia. And so what you see here uh, on the slide is a picture of the beautiful Jerobin and the Hawkesbury River downstream of Marangora, which is also known as Richmond, New South Wales, where our university has the Hawkesbury campus at the foothills of Kolomata, the Blue Mountains. And so my talk um, will be covering the amazing world of insect microbe symbiosis. Um, well, I, I I don't, I won't be able to cover everything. There's so much to be said about. Um, one um, point that, um, that really has inspired me um, going into this research is um, the endosymbiosis theory, which was proposed some time ago by Lynn Margulis. And here a painting um, in homage to her work. And so Lynn really has uh, um, suggested or proposed that uh, many or uh, some evolutionary major transitions really have occurred through the close symbiotic interaction between prokaryotic and eukaryotic organisms. So, and so um, this year in particular, we actually have an anniversary or centenary of uh, a book that's been published a hundred years ago. Uh, by Paul Buchner, and Paul Buchner is the founding father, or one of the founding fathers of insect microbial symbiosis uh, research. And so this book was uh, first published in German, but a uh, fourth edition was then translated into English in 1965. And back then, um, when this is early days of microbial uh, taxonomy or classification systems. So uh, back then, uh, researchers referred to um, the microbial organisms as being of um, plant, um, plant, plant uh, origin. And uh, so in his book, he really uh, was quite fascinated by the veritable fairyland of insect symbiosis that exists out there. And so before um, I will, um, give an, an overview of some of the research projects we've been doing on uh, insect microbial symbiosis in, in our team here at uh, Western Sydney University. Um, just a, a short overview of what insect uh, microbial symbionts can be. So there's a huge diversity of interactions and associations of um, insects with viruses, bacteria, fungi, unicellular eukaryotes, and microinvertebrates. In and symbiosis or symbionts by themselves are not really defined on, along a cost benefit uh, perspective because they can include both beneficial, uh, symbionts can be both beneficial or costly. And so um, the term symbion per se does not really preclude costly interactions. Then symbionts can be highly. Uh, the hosts can be highly dependent on symbionts, in which case those symbionts are often referred to as obligate symbionts, or they can on, only be uh, in uh, hosts um, under certain circumstances and provide uh, benefits to the host under certain circumstances. And so they are then more considered as facultative uh, symbionts. 
Furthermore, host specificity varies too. Some simons are highly host specific as opposed to other simons can have a very broad host range. Um, also differ to the modes of transmission. Uh, many simons are vertically inherited versus others may be horizontally transmitted and thereby um, infectious. And so many of, or some of the very strictly vertically inherited uh, symbonds also can uh, experience uh, coagulation relationships, which reflect themselves in co-speciation patterns. So the phylogenies of the host and the symbon reflect each other. Or in other cases, they can, these relationships can also be very diffuse with um, many events of host switching occurring between hosts uh, of symbonds between hosts. And another um, um, differentiation of symbonds can be according to uh, their localization and of the interaction with the host. So we have extracellular symbonds in insects that these can be the gut bacteria or ectosymbiotic fungi on the outside of um, an insect host or intracellular, which uh, includes all the, for example, endosymbiotic bacteria. And so while our research team over the last, uh, of, of, over several years now has focused on um, interactions of Queensland fruit fly and microbes, I will not be talking a lot about those in my talk today. However, others, uh, other team members will be presenting their research throughout the very uh, nice conference over the next couple of days. And so this includes work done by um, about the work that has happened in this space in our laboratory were on um, the gut bacteria of dephrodites, uh, in particular the gut microbiome of pea fly across its range, the impacts of domestication and um, also irradiation in the context of sterile insect technique with uh, the opportunity for probiotic manipulation of um, fly cultures with particular gut bacteria. Um, other work has focused on um, the Wolvachia in Tephrodis, so Wolvachia bacterial endosymbion that can cause crossing incompatibilities or sterilities, and thereby can be of interest for pest management. And so um, both Jen Morrow and um, Sharon Towart will be talking about uh, their research um, today and also on Thursday. Uh, about Wolvachia interactions with fruit flies, definitely fruit flies, as well as uh, surprising uh, finding of interactions also with fruit fly parasitoids. Then um, one um, ang research angle in our team also looks at entomopathogenic nematodes and their uh, capacity in um, use of biological control of Queensland fruit fly. And so for this, Citrum Ariel has been collecting entomopathogenic nematodes across the natural range or like across the range of Queensland fruit fly uh, in order to uh, assess their uh, infectivity and pathogenicity in Q-fly. And it, it, I point out here that the pathogenicity of entomopathogenic nematodes actually completely relies or, in, or relies heavily on the presence of symbiotic bacteria that um, their nematodes are so associated with. And uh, finally, um, Stephen Sharp has been looking at the diversity of RNA viruses in Queensland fruit fly, uh, assessed its um, the viruses fitness effects on the host as well as uh, the transmission ecology. And so Stephen will be presenting some of his work um, today, this afternoon in the Tefferty Symposium. Then another area of research in our team has looked at the association of ambrosia beetles with ectosymbiotic fungi, uh, also known as ambrosia fungi. And here, just a one slide overview of the fascinating uh, work done by several team members um, with uh, a focus here on Australopithecus incompertus, which is a member of uh, one of the two subfamilies of the beetles that are considered ambrosia beetles or can be considered ambrosia beetles. So the Osteoplatypus incompertus belongs to the platybodines and is also known as the only uh, eusocial uh, beetle uh, that exists. Um, so Debbie Kent has investigated this uh, quite some time ago 
uh, and found out that um, about the demonstrated dissociality in this species and followed up by Shannon Smith, who has uh, demonstrated that uh, the foundress queen uh, mates once and then sort of um, starts building a gallery in a eucalypt tree, uh, oviposits, and uh, builds, build, build, put, keeps building the gallery uh, and uh, together with uh, her daughter offspring and maintaining the gallery uh, for a very long time, up to more than 30 years. Uh, and, uh, and whereas uh, some of the offspring leave, the male offspring leaves, the, uh, some of the female offspring stays behind as uh, daughter workers to take care of the gallery maintenance, but also to culture the uh, symbiotic, ectosymbiotic fungi in the gallery that are the main so these fungi are the main nutrient source for uh, Ostroplatus in Compertus. And so uh, Robert Miller, a former PhD student in our, our team has um, isolated the fungus that this beetle is uh, obligately associated with. And so uh, we named, or we're going to name this fungus as Raphaelia kenti in, in honorum to um, Debbie's work. And, um, and so here on, uh, you see on the, the macangial plate on the um, thorax of the Australopithecus in Compertus where the female can carry spores of the fungi as, she, as they leave a gallery to then um, be able to inoculate a new gallery and a new tree with, with the fungal uh, spores that then germinate and uh, and so the fungal garden can be cultured. And uh, another person, well, like James Bickerstaff, then came uh, and joined the team and investigated um, the population genetic structure of Ostroplasmus in Compertus across its natural range. It occurs uh, from uh, Victoria all the way up to northern New South Wales. and. It appears based on uh, James' work that, uh, in fact, there might well be two closely related species sitting within this one that are genetically um, uh, distinct from each other. Uh, on the left, you see the um, uh, phylogenetic tree of the mitochondrial haplotypes across different populations, but then uh, that's the technology analysis also confirmed uh, a clear population structuring uh, between the northern and southern um, regions of the distribution. Uh, what is amazing though is that the fungus per se doesn't seem to have diversified. So there is very high clo near cl clonal distribution of the fungus in association with the, dif with the two different lineages of Ostroplatypus in Compertus. Okay, which brings me to the next uh, group of um, um, or the, the one group of symbonts that we have done a lot of work on. And so this is the group of heritable, heritable bacterial endosymbonts. And so here an overview provided by Nancy Moran quite some time ago of the different, um, um, of different types of symbonts um, placed across a phylogenetic tree from different uh, bacterial phyla. And so um, there are four different types of uh, symbonts. So you've got endosymbonts that are associated with uh, bacteriums or cellular structures within uh, the hosts. And so these are often uh, also called the obligate symbonts. Um, then there are the facultative mutualists, um, which are not found in, not always found in all individuals of a host species. And um, the term mutualist somehow has uh, become a, um, so it, it's, it's shifting in its use because um, simons per se and the simons per se don't really have a choice. So they are not free living anymore. So, um, and, and, and the control of uh, being in the simbond really, uh, in the host, three really, uh, the host has a strong. Um, influence on the mutualist. So it's sort of a, a one-way avenue uh, where the term mutualist per se perhaps doesn't apply anymore. So they are really beneficial, highly beneficial, or they can be beneficial endosymbonts instead. 
Then uh, there's the large group or the, the increasing group of facultative reproductive manipulators, such as uh, Wolbachia and Cardinium. And uh, there are also endosymbionts for which we just don't know function yet, but uh, symbionts that are uh, detected consistently in host species. And one of the endosymbionts um, or the, one of the host species or groups that we've looked at in our team uh, includes the psyllids. And so psyllids have had uh, a long known association with obligate endosymbionts. And this goes even back to the days of Paul Buchner, one of his PhD students, Joachim Proft, detected uh, bacterial uh, structures or bacterial uh, organisms within alien psyllid species. And back then, it was already apparent that there are um, symbionts involved that have different um, appearance. And so he, they were classified as primary endosymbionts, um, which were located in the macetocytes or bacteriocytes. And so that primary endosymbiont was later called uh, Candidatus carcinella radi. And um, then the secondary endosymbionts, which are located in the syncytium, which is uh, the tissue surrounding those um, bacteriocytes. And um, however, it's also so that uh, more recent research demonstrates that these secondary symbionts, endosymbionts, are just as obligate or can be just as obligate or important to the host as, as the primary symbiont. And one, one reason for that is that Casanella Ruddy uh, has, is one of um, the endosymbionts with the smallest bacterial genomes that we know of. And so uh, many bacterial endosymbionts experience a uh, mechanism of uh, genome, uh, gene loss and genome size reduction. And so, um, so some of the pathways that those symbionts are really important for in sense of providing uh, nutrients or amino acids to the uh, host, um, mutate and lose function. And so uh, there is, and those secondary endosymbionts can then replace or refill those lost functions and complement uh, thereby the symbolic system. And so here on the left hand side, you see. Um, Acadia spina nymph, um, so first instar of a, a, a forming Australian lobe forming uh, psyllid species. Um, with uh, where it can be become it very becomes apparent the bacterium, the structure within the abdomen where those um, obligate symbionts are located. So psyllids are um, a large. Um, um, group of, well, that includes, um, it's, a, it's a superfamily, Psyllodea, which includes 4,000 species worldwide and in eight families, and includes several key important um, plant pathogens, vectors, as well as herbivores. And Australia has got about 10% of the global diversity in 44 genera, and up in Australia, the um, psyllids of the um, Family Aphelaridae are particularly diverse on eucalyptus, but there's also very diverse um, psyllids on acacia and um, with some high host specificity. Of um, quite amazing um, um, a, a speciality of the Australian diversity is the lerp forming or and gall forming uh, psyllids. So there is uh, not just psyllids that are free living, but some actually. Um, live underneath shelters um, on the lerps or can uh, live within goals that um, they form, uh, the plants form uh, in response to psyllid uh, feeding. And they also can have different ecological um, interactions with plants in sense of uh, feeding either on old mature foliage or feeding on flush young growth foliage. And so uh, Jen Morrow, some years ago now uh, went out and we collected a large number of uh, spe specimens of, of samples of different, of 25 different psyllid species from four different families. 
um, in order to assess the diversity of um, bacterial symbionts. And so we tried to distribute or include species that were either log following, free leading, and have different feeding um, preferences, uh, either senescence feeding or flush feeding, or included also gold forming cilids. And these samples were then processed for the analysis of six, by um, 16 um, sRGNA amplicon sequencing. So this is a gene that's uh, used for the classification of bacterial um, diversity. And the result, returned result is that all psyllids um, contained personella as the bacterial primary endosome one. Um, I note here, uh, what you see here is um, a graph with uh, different bars, each bar representing a different species and the different colors are different operational taxonomic units and the carcinella is the black box at the bottom of each of those bars. I note that the, um, the, the relative abundance of carcinella here appears low, but this is uh, an actual um, limitation of the technology we have applied because we have used primers that were not preferentially amplifying the 16S gene of Carcinella, but we're, we were targeting primers or wanting to use primers that are bringing us uh, a better resolution on all the other bacteria that are potentially found in, in psyllids. And so now, uh, if you look at um, all the, the different OTUs that are in the psyllids besides the carcinella, you can see that overall psyllids do not have a large diversity of bacterial um, symbionts. And so for many of those species, there's only uh, one, two or three different bacteria present, uh, bacterial type or operational taxonomic units present uh, bits besides the carcinella. And so some of those are grouped in, um, they're all entro belonging to the families of Enterobacteriaceae. And um, this includes um, Asinophonus, Sodalis like um, bacteria, and um, bacteria of the Enterobacteriaceae that haven't been named or characterized yet. It's also been uh, interesting to find uh, for some species, we were able to get hold of specimens and samples from uh, populations collected in Australia, but also from populations collected overseas, where some of those eucalypt feeding psyllids have become um, established as invasive pests. And Jen found that in the invasive range, the bacterial diversity of those eucalypt feeding psyllids was less than in the native range in Australia. And um, in order to then also ground proof the finding uh, about the low relative abundance found for Carcinella in the amplicon sequencing runs, then uh, also did a test where specifically um, the Carcinella was Carcinella genes were quantified against um, uh, like assessed in, in relative um, title or relative presence. And, and it was then became clear that carcinella in fact is more prevalent or more dominantly present in all of the psyllids when compared to other secondary symbols such as here as in the and sodalis. And this test was done uh, across a set of different cardiospinal species. So these are all lerp forming psyllids feeding on eucalypts, uh, where several of those species can also cause massive or can cause problems by defoliating eucalypts. Um, a, a, a feature, and so, so this, this really indicates also that all the endosome ones, both the primary and secondary endosome ones, are inherited. Uh, from the female to the, her offspring. And um, the very strict inheritance of many generations has led to the co-divergence of the primary endosome one with the hosts as uh, seen for um, the Carcinella um, phylogeny under 
top right hand uh, dendrogram and the psyllid uh, phylogeny on the left hand side, where for all the um, psyllids of the Afalaridae, uh, the Carcinella phylogeny really reflects one to one the phylogeny of the host. However, the, interestingly, the secondary symbonts um, don't show this pattern as strictly. So for um, the species that we analyzed, uh, it became apparent that, um, for example, some of the um, symbonts uh, experienced uh, host switches, between, or in particular asinophonus, where um, Silid asinophonus, close relatives of silid asinophonus were also detected in aphids and uh, vice versa. So um, th this means that um, although the Carcinella has uh, been strictly co evolving and co diverging with the silids, that these uh, secondary symbonts uh, are sometimes lost and replaced um, by new secondary endosymbonts acquired from other host lineages. Then um, the talk from the rest of the talk, I will now focus on two reproductive uh, manipulators um, that are um, well, the, the, the two most common endosymbonts, bacterial endosymbonts. So this is Ovarca pipientis on one side, a proteobacterium, and Cardinium hertigi, a bacterium of a completely different phylum, the Bacteroidetes. Uh, they are both intracellular bacteria commonly found in arthropod species. So an estimate uh, is that about 52% of all arthropod species are infected by Wolbachia, and 13% of arthropod species carry uh, cardinium. And both um, can also co-occur in, in, in species and host individuals. So about one to 2% of species actually are co-infected by both of these bacteria. And when these bacteria were first discovered, uh, they were discovered based on their way of manipulation of reproduction of hosts. And so the most common reproductive mode of manipulation across um, both, for both species, uh, and, for both endosymbonts, Wobach and Cardinium, is a cytoplasmic incompatibility. And so I will explain in more detail what that involves but, uh, in, in the next uh, slide. Uh, but it is a crossing barrier between infected and uninfected individuals. Then in, in some host species, um, both Wolbach and Cardinum can also cause Teletokos pathogenesis, which results in uh, the production of female offspring without the need of fertilization. And so this really applies and occurs mostly in host species that would otherwise be haplodiploid, have a haplodiploid sex determination system where only um, diploid individuals are females and haploid individuals are males. So in teletogy, um, all uh, a female is able to produce female offspring uh, with the help of these endosymbonts, or throughout the, because of the manipulation of those uh, endosymbonts, and so no males will be produced. Then uh, another reproductive manipulation is uh, male killing, which has been detected for Wolbachia, uh, which uh, results in the embryonic mortality or larval mortality of male offspring uh, of uh, Wolbachia infected uh, female. And a very rare, um, for insect, very rare effect of feminization uh, where Wolbachia and Cardinium can turn individuals that are genetically constituted males uh, into uh, females. And so uh, we have uh, a couple of years ago looked into this further and found that, uh, in fact, Wolbachia can manipulate uh, the inheritance of sex chromosome. And so either it um, changes, causes a meiotic drive, or it or disrupts the inheritance of uh, sex chromosomes. And so all of these reproductive manipulations, the common uh, strategy here for the endosymbonts is to increase the reproductive fitness of 
uh, host so that um, um, females, females infected by Wolbachia are uh, relatively more reproductively fit than females um, that are not infected. And so, um, so that, that's a very, that's the key strategy uh, that's shared uh, across all of those manipulations. However, more recent, um, there's recently increasing research findings also showing that uh, these endosome ones can also have auto fitness effects. Uh, first, they were discovered as fitness costs, such as reduced fecundity, for example. But in some hosts, uh, these endosome ones also bring fitness benefits, um, uh, such as increased fecundity, for example, or um, protection of a host from um, from pathogens such as uh, viruses or um, um, other, other, other pathogens. Now to the most common side of, um, um, reproductive mode of manipulation, or most common mode of reproductive manipulation. So that's um, the cytoplasmic incompatibility. Um, here, an overview of uh, the what, what that involves. So um, the cytoplasmic incompatibility applies to the bottom row where an infected male mates with an uninfected female. Uh, all of the offspring of this uh, mating order, this results in um, embryonic mortality. And so uh, this uh, combination will result either in a reduced offspring number or no offspring at all depending on whether the cytoplasmic incompatibility level is complete or partial. As opposed to all the, the three other crossing combinations where, um, in com where um, there's full compatibility. So uh, infected females can mate with both infected and uninfected uh, males and will produce infected offspring uh, in comparison to the uninfected pair, which can produce uninfected offspring. So we have in our team looked at um, endosome ones in a Bulbachia and Cardinum in a, in, in a species of uh, thrips. And so thrips are particularly interesting um, with regards to endosome research. Uh, I mean, first of all, there's two suburbs Terebrancia and tubulifera. So we've just really looked at uh, um, a species within the terebrancia. So I'll point out what, what we found may not apply to all the thrips. Nevertheless, um, thrips are um, interesting because they have independently evolved haplodiploidy, the species that are eusocial as well as uh, Trips also have uh, holometabolous metamorphosis. They are important plant virus vectors. Some, um, some species are, and um, in comparison with many other insect species, um, they thrips in general have quite simple microbiomes. So uh, this means just a small number of um, gut bacteria species and a uh, few thrip species also have associations with Wolbachia, uh, where Wolbachia can cause the lithoche in some or in other species Wolbachia, the presence of Wolbachia doesn't change arenotocus reproduction in sense of uh, un um, unmated females producing male offspring and uh, mated females with, are able to produce um, fertilized eggs, which result in female offspring, and unfertilized eggs, which still produce male offspring. So the species that we've looked at is the Kelly citrus strips, also known as species strips, Kellyanus, a uh, member of the family of Stripidae. And this species was first described in Australia in 1916 and was discovered in different parts of the world uh, throughout the last century. And it was not quite clear where it originated from because of the way how it was distributed. So it's currently distributed in Australasia. Uh, there is, it also occurs in the Mediterranean uh, region. And, um, and so, so it was not fully clear where the origin of this species sits, uh, although it has 
um, relation, or it has associations with Australian native flora, um, yet it can also feed on, uh, on citrus. So it is in fact an important pest of um, many citrus species in Australia as well as in overseas. So um, this um, led us or led um, a former PhD student in our team, Zung Nguyen, um, investigate the genetic diversity of uh, this strips Kellyanus. So we sampled strips from different parts of Australia as well as from the invasive range in, um, in New Zealand as well as in uh, the Mediterranean region. And, um, and then Zoom tested these strips for or sequenced their mitochondrial uh, gene cytochrome oxidase 1 as well as the nuclear gene elongation factor 1 alpha. And by analyzing the genetic diversity across these two different laws, it became clear that Australian population and Australian individuals had the highest haplotype and allelic diversity. And it also became clear for the mitochondrial um, diversity that both the Mediterranean populations only share one haplotype and the New Zealand population just had one haplotype, which is indicative of them uh, possibly having experienced a bottleneck uh, in, in the invasion process. And this is another indication or confirmation that uh, together with the high gene diversity, the genetic diversity in Australia, that Australia is the origin of this species and both the Mediterranean region and New Zealand are uh, part of the invasive range. In, uh, when analyzing uh, these uh, thrips, individuals and populations, Zoom also detected two endosymbionts, Wabaki and Cardinium, in the uh, in individuals. And so it became apparent that the populations in the native range both had uh, individuals that both had Wabaki and Cardinium, as opposed to in the invasive range, Wabaki was not found, was not present. Um, so this led us to a question that uh, we, we were at that stage not able to answer. Was, was Wolvakia either lost in the invasive range or had Wolvakia been acquired at a later stage uh, or not been uh, in the individuals that established those um, invasive ranges? We did not know. Um, and Alihan Katlaf, a, a grad student in, in, my, in our team, will present um, more findings on this uh, later in the week of this conference. What Azung did next is um, she was able to remove the bacterial endosymbionts from a laboratory culture, thereby creating or um, starting different lines uh, that either were infected with both Cardinium and Wolbachia, a line that was completely uninfected, and a line that only had Cardinium without uh, Wolbachia. It was not possible uh, to establish a line that just had uh, Wolbachia without the presence of cadenium. This then allowed us to test whether these strains, these bacterial endosymbionts, can cause cytoplasmic incompatibility by uh, setting up reciprocal crosses and control crosses between the three different infection types. But it also allowed comparisons between virgin and mated females, as well as um, what that means for offspring. Uh, survival and bronic mortality, fecundity, sex ratio, as well as bacterial titles. And before I show the results, I now need to explain a bit more what the expectations are for cytoplasmic incompatibility for a haplodiploid host. Uh, as I mentioned before, haplodiploids uh, have actually um, uh, control over fertilization. So a female can, a mated female can decide whether eggs are being fertilized or not fertilized, and only fertilized eggs result into, uh, develop into females, as opposed to unfertilized eggs uh, result into um, males. And so now, um, when, when cytoplasmic incompatibility occurs in a haplodiploid host species, there's two potential outcomes. And so this is uh, depicted here at the bottom of uh, this graph. 
so phenol mortality type of cytoplasmic incompatibility occurs when all the fertilized eggs don't develop. And so there's embryonic mortality of all eggs that are there destined to become females. And the male eggs that are not, or the eggs that are not fertilized still develop into males. And then there's also another type of uh, cytoplasmic incompatibility known as male development, where those fertilized eggs actually are converted and develop as males. And so uh, male development CI actually is reflected in producing lots of male offspring and so of uninfected offspring. And so this can actually be um, uh, a, a reduction of uh, or reduced uh, invasion efficiency of these endosome bonds in host populations because um, uh, a CI cross will result in production of lots of uninfect, uninfected males. And so it is going to be hard for the um, infected males or like to, for, for the endosome to take a foothold in those populations. And then the crossing experiments then um, that Zoom did revealed that um, all of the CI crosses, which are here boxed into um, red for the cadenium CI cross, resulted in production of no female offspring. Apologies. And um, the same also, it, so this is in the previous last um, column. And uh, for Wobake also result, Wobake CI crosses also resulted in uh, production of no female offspring. And so the key difference that became apparent between uh, CI caused by Wolbachia and cardinium was that um, the cardinium CI cross actually produced a large number of male offspring as opposed to the Wolbachia CI cross did not produce a large number of male offspring. And therefore, we were able to conclude that uh, both endosome bonds um, cause uh, cytoplasmic incompatibility. Cardinium is responsible for a male development CI, and Wobake is uh, causes a female mortality type of CI. One other aspect, however, that was this, that came as a surprise was that, well, first of all, all it, it was clear that uh, virgin females produced uh, male offspring without, uh, and, and, and so uh, that confirmed that Azotrips calianus is arenotocus. However, some of the mated females produced uh, not just, um, did not produce female offspring at all. So, um, something else was going on here, which was not uh, explained by uh, the presence or absence of the bacteria. And so this uh, brought into um, Alihan Kadla, uh, another grad student in our uh, team, who then investigated this in more detail. And so Alihan compared uh, or um, assessed the mated females in their offspring sex ratio and found that um, some uh, females um, on the left hand side, some mated females produce uh, female biased uh, offspring. And so they are uh, females that produce uh, female broods. And then on the right hand side, some mated females produced uh, male only offspring or highly male biased uh, broods or hen broods. And in comparison, uh, the bar next to the mated uh, female shows the virgin females that only produce male offspring. Therefore, there are in, in three types of mothers uh, involved here. So there's virgins, then there's mated females that can produce or that only produce male broods, and mated females, sorry, I should say mated females that produce. Uh, adverts. And resulting from this, there's also four types of offspring. So there's uh, three types of males, the uh, male offspring of virgins, the male offspring of uh, m -bird producing females, and the male offspring of f -bird producing uh, females. And there's only one type of female 
the femur that's been produced by femurs with F bruise. And next, Ali Hanen tested uh, for different, the effect of different maternal or paternal factors in uh, causing this. And so um, mating duration did not change the pattern of the um, Uh, okay, guys, sorry, I'm running over time. So, um, yeah, thanks, Barry. So, so um, Ali has shown that the mating duration does not impact the, um, um, the, the distribution between uh, male, uh, the F brood and M brood production. Also, all the females that had produced root were successfully inseminated. And this was shown by uh, finding by, was demonstrated by finding sperm in the spermatheca. Furthermore, um, male body size did not have an effect on the distribution of the two types of uh, male brood producing females and female fruit producing females. And however, uh, an effect was found in um, in the way how um, the fitness factors of um, of um, of the female of the mother. So so now there is um, exercise. Like um, so, Alihan found that the females that were um, unconstrained. Um, so this is the females that produced F broods had uh, produced larger eggs than the females that were constrained, which produced uh, small uh, eggs. And so con therefore this split sex ratio that you just found was linked to a uh, constrained sex ratio depending on the maternal condition. And so average egg size um, before mating uh, predicts uh, the probability of M or F fruit production after uh, mating. So females that produce large eggs are more, the hell eggs are more likely to become fertilized and therefore turn into female offspring than um, eggs of. Um, and this then also, and, and the forewing length as a fitness. Uh, um, uh, fitness parameter of uh, females also resulted in the predicted whether um, females were producing M roots or F roots. So that means larger eggs, or what at the same time Alien also found in a different study, is that larger eggs are more likely to become fertilized and then therefore develop as females. And so here, just a quick overview of what, how this. Um, um, comes or what the mechanism behind this is, the like mechanism behind this is. So uh, on the bottom, you see a, a graph of the reproductive organ of the of a, of a thrips female where in the ovary, the mature X, provisioned X leaves uh, the ovary and then passes through the ovary duct, the sperma theca and the larger X then stimulate the muscle to the spermathecal duct so that uh, sperm is released and the larger eggs thereby get fertilized in the fertilization chamber as opposed to smaller eggs when they pass through the ovary duct may not uh, stimulate this muscle uh, tissue and thereby sperm is not released. So there's a clear uh, potential, well, there's a, um, our oh, Alihan's findings clearly suggest there's a um, a mechanistic response to excise in fertilization control. Furthermore, excise also predicts um, survival from egg to adult, here seen on the um, left hand side. Then it also predicts larva body size, uh, larger eggs result into larva larvae developing, as well as offspring uh, size. So um, as a clear effect on of excise provisioning 
on uh, not just sex uh, ratio, but then also on offspring survival and fitness. And so this then led to the elephant in the room question, do endosymbionts influence the sex allocation system? And Ali Han found, or we found yes, because in the uninfected population, we found that um, constrained and unconstrained um, females occurred at similar um, proportions, whereas in the infected populations, the constrained females, they are more common. So, and so this is due to cardinium, uh, where Wolbachia does not seem to change or just slightly reduce uh, the effect of uh, that cardinium is having. Next, Alihan measured uh, excises across different infection types, model types, and offspring types, and found that cardinium increases excise versus uh, uh, Wolbachia can act antagonistic to cardinium in, in this context. Furthermore, influences of endosymbonts was found on offspring development traits. Uh, Wolbachia slows development, cardinium um, as opposed to um, cardinium uh, and um, doesn't have an effect on development time in comparison to uninfected. Then cardinium can increase uh, the survival and um, both cardinium and Wolbachia can increase the juvenile survival. Cardinium and Wolbachia increase offspring size, and cardinium also and Wolbachia increase the longevity when strips are exposed to the dehydration stress. So this means cardinium and Wolbachia can influence sex allocation system of hosts by increasing fertilization and thereby increase prevalence in host populations. And so similar sex allocation effects of endosimmons have also been recently found for other endosimmons, such as Alcimiconus and Hamiltonella. However, it was not clear or it hasn't been clear so far what the responsible mechanism has could be behind this. And uh, so our work shows that endosimmons can increase excise provisioning to X and thereby increase fertilization success rates. And uh, this then results in higher female production. And so I note here, this is a pre-psychotic effect. So, um, and thereby can act in companion with uh, cytoplasmic incompatibility, which is a post-psychotic effect in helping to innovate host populations. And so I mentioned before, both endosimmons have different types of CI with uh, cardinium having a male development CI, which is less efficacious, efficacious in invasion. So in having this very strong beneficial effect of excise provisioning in cardinium individuals may help uh, this endosimmon in invading host population. Team behind me that I would like to thank, and uh, this is collaborators like in our laboratory, as well as colleagues at our university, as well across Australia and overseas and uh, a good number of uh, funding agencies over the last 10 years or so um, we have been working on tender symbionts and other microbial symbionts. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus, for such a fantastic talk. I think we have time for maybe one question. And if you have any additional ones, please feel free to contact Marcus through a direct message in the chat. Uh, if you want to ask a question, feel free to just unmute yourself. I have a question for Marcus. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Do you think in the future it might be possible to um, knock out individual strains of bacteria to see what their effect on, on fitness might be? Like if you wanted to knock out one, but not the rest? Yes, well, we, yes, well, um, we, 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 can, yeah, remove, yeah. we can remove bacteria through um, antibody treatment. So we've been able to remove both at once or removing um, it's possible to remove Wolbachia once. We weren't able to get just uh, the Wolbachia only infected line, but in many other in many other hosts, it is possible to um, uh, sort of um, treat hosts so that all the different infection types become available for doing those types of experiments. 
I don't know whether that answers your question, John. I was just wondering if maybe, you know, with some kind of, you know, in the future, some kind of gene editing technology, you could possibly, you could knock out a specific bacteria. I wonder if that's been tried or uh, anyone suggested doing that. Uh, I, well, I think I think there's research of that nature happening in um, with some of the obligate symbonts, um, the primary endosymbonts and aphids and so on. Um, certainly, certainly there, 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 there's an opportunity for this to occur. And also, um, I mean, the interest is also the applied interest, whether this could perhaps become then useful for pest management of pests. Uh, so controlling or, or interfering with the symbiotic system of a pest may be an avenue to control the pest itself. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So 